So hey everybody, welcome to ARE Live. I'm Mark Tier, the founder of Black Spectacles. And today we're gonna to be covering the topic, how to remove diversity obstacles uh, from uh, licensure. Uh, we have a panel of architects who are gonna share their experiences and provide some uh, advice on how to overcome these obstacles. Um, at our next ARE Live broadcast on March 19th, uh, we're gonna be covering uh, construction and evaluation with Mike Newman. And we will again be using a mock exam format to cover uh, construction and evaluation knowledge and skills related to bidding and negotiating processes, support of the construction process, um, and a variety of other topics relating to that exam. So uh, be sure to, uh, to register for that. Um, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, a little bit about Black Spectacles. We're the first ever NCARB approved test prep provider for all six of the ARE 5.0 divisions. Um, and we offer a different, you know, some test prep uh, in a couple of different levels. Um, and we also recently launched an online forum, which we're calling our ARE community. In our communities, for those of you who have questions about the material on the ARE, or who want to network with other architects, um, as well as those who just want to share their knowledge and experience to aid others on their journey to licensure. Um, one of, I think, our most popular features so far in our very young uh, community is our, uh, is our practice quizzes that we post every week uh, on the forum. Uh, so it's uh, it's free of charge. You can just go onto our community and check it out, um, and you can engage with some of the conversations that are going on there and brush up on some of your skills. So you can go to community.blackspectacles.com um, to learn more about that. I just shared the link in the chat box. And then lastly, um, our team here at Black Spectacles is going to be uh, leading some lunch and learns in Los Angeles in May um, around the AIA convention, uh, A20, so uh, on May 11th, 12th, and 13th. Um, and so if that's something you guys might be interested in us buying you some Jimmy John's or I guess in Los Angeles, it's probably something cooler than Jimmy John's. Yeah, in an out Burger, I assume. But I'm sure if you're from Los Angeles, you're like, really? <laughs> in an out Burger again? Um, so regardless, uh, these guys uh, will come bring you lunch and, and talk a little bit about um, some of the things we've been learning about how folks um, uh, can successfully pass the exams. So I just posted another link in the chat box um, to learn a little bit more about that. Just fill out the form uh, and at, in, in the sort of the open box at the end, just put something about lunch and learns um, and we'll get in touch to, to see if we can figure something out. So um, so that's, what's, uh, that's everything that's going on there uh, in terms of updates to our products. Uh, so next, I'm going to introduce our panel. So we have uh, so myself and, and four, uh, four folks uh, joining us today. Um, first, I'm going to start with Antoine. Uh, Antoine, uh, are you there? I am. Good afternoon. Good, good, good to have you with us. Pleasure to be here. Uh, uh, yeah. So let me see here. Uh, so a little bit about Antoine. So Antoine's an associate with Moody Nolan uh, in Houston, uh, which is the nation's largest firm under African-American leadership. Antoine serves on the board of directors for NOMA as uh, the director of strategic partnerships. Additionally, he's led many initiatives in, in affiliation with the city of Houston Planning Commission in Columbus, Ohio, in Washington, D.C., and nearly a dozen other cities across the country. So Antoine, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Um, sitting across from me here in Chicago is April Hughes. Uh, April is the owner and managing principal at HPZS in Chicago. Uh, she's leading the firm, starting a new chapter in its history as a woman-owned business with the aim to preserve a sustainable future for the Chicago community. Um, she's also the president of, the, of AI Chicago's board of directors for 2020, uh, and her work has been featured in a variety of news outlets and publications. So welcome, April. Thanks for having me, Mark. And uh, Jennifer, so Jennifer Johnson, uh, she is also joining us. She's an associate with Moody Nolan uh, here in Chicago, although she's in Atlanta today, um, and she's been an active member of NOMA uh, since 2007 and currently serves as the vice president of the Illinois chapter. She's been involved with a host of uh, organizations serving sh uh, children in the Chicago community, including My Block, My Hood, My City, I NOMA's Project Pipeline, and the AI Chicago uh, chapters architectural workshops for the Chicago Public Schools. So welcome, Jennifer. Thanks for having me. Uh, and Alexandra. Uh, so Alexandra uh, Kolchiar uh, is a project manager uh, of the healthcare division at Brower and Hotman Architecture. She has 10 years of experience in multifamily, high-end residential, commercial education, and healthcare design. And Alexandra was born in Europe and moved to the United States as a teenager 
um, and English is her second language. So, um, Alexandra, it's a pleasure to have you as well. Thanks. So, yeah, so uh, thanks for being with us. So, um, as you guys know, for today's episode, we're deviating from our, you know, our usual mock exam format to focus on a conversation that's important to the profession. Um, and to get started, um, um, let me grab this note here. So we're here to talk about first about some of the obstacles that folks have observed uh, in their own career around diversity and licensure, um, and and even in in uh, in their peers. And so to get started, uh, Alexandra, first I want to start with you. Um, one of the obstacles that folks uh, in our conversations that we've had over the last week. Um, have uh, sort of agreed upon is around unconscious bias and assumptions. Alexandra, can you talk a little bit about your observations around this obstacle? Of course. Uh, primarily mine are a little bit more regarding culture and language barrier and also measurement units going from to imperial from metric is chaotic in its own. Um, but overall, what I've what I've started noticing is even moving into the profession, I've had to slowly work on my accent, and that's a little shame to say, as you can probably hear my mother and my sister have an accent. But for me, it was because when I interacted with construction um, managers and even clients, and I started struggling with words and the lingo, it started to seem that I was unprofessional or I was unknowledgeable, even though I had I had the experience, I had the words, they just, I was put on the spot. So because mm -hmm. part of the time I'm translating about 60 to 7% of the time, it just takes longer <laughs> to formulate mm -hmm. the sentence or have the reaction needed. And, and it just seems, it seems to be a negative. So I've worked really hard to try to kind of just talk the talk overly prepare, um, create some sort of solutions that I can jump ahead of it and kind of kind of mitigate it. Um, besides that I've had I've had primarily issues with the with the measuring units and I know that that's also a problem mm -hmm. going into the tests themselves. Um, mm -hmm. You know we have the standard, the IBC tells you certain dimensions, the ADA gives you certain dimensions. So there's all these dimensions that you have to rememorize and rework with, and it, it's a struggle. Mm -hmm. But I've learned to just to not fight it, mm -hmm. give in, and just memorize it. It's essentially a memorization and a make it your second reaction. Uh, it just it takes a lot. Yeah. So it's interesting to hear you talk about that. You talk about um, your your sort of interpreting or having to kind of like. Uh, translate 60 to 70 percent mm -hmm. of what you're hearing so your brain is working twice as hard basically um, uh, in order to you know uh, uh, to sort of process the information that's coming in um, April you um, I've also observed um, unconscious bias and assumptions as an obstacle in, in this um, can you tell talk a little bit about that Sure. Um, so in my career at this point, I'm leading a firm, I'm leading a board, I'm nearing 40 years old, <laughs> and still sometimes in front of a client uh, for the first time, if I'm with a male colleague, I'll be, I'll be addressed seconds, mm -hmm. um, or I'll be asked, you know, in other scenarios, if I'm the interior designer, or the landscape designer, which there's nothing wrong with those professions, obviously, but it's this context of being in a highly technical male dominated environment that mm -hmm. makes certain individuals feel as though I'm not the authority in the room. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, I, it's becoming less of an issue, the more time and the more people I meet and get um, FaceTime in front of them. But mm -hmm. It's definitely, an, if it's an issue for me, I'm sure it's an issue for others as well. Mm -hmm. um, Antoine, how about yourself? Uh, what types of uh, obstacles have you observed around unconscious bias and assumptions? I think there's, there's quite a few. I think both of the ones that the ladies talked about are very real issues. But even when we're talking about the exam itself and the education itself, uh, many of our, in higher, our schools of higher learning don't really cover the experience and achievements of people of color when it comes to architecture. It's just not covered at all. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, the contributions that we have contributed and that we've given to the discipline are not covered, and you don't have anything to adhere to as a young professional. Uh, furthermore, when you're studying, 
uh, it would be helpful. I think people really do adhere and grow when they can have a very firm grasp and appreciation of the knowledge. And if the knowledge reflects their experience and their background, then it's easier to, 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 to uh, adhere to and to learn. And that's not covered in the exam at all. You know, what happens in minority neighborhoods, how things are learned, how things grow, those things are never covered in the exam as it stands, and it's an extension of what we're seeing in school. And so there's a huge gap there that I think is a real opportunity uh, for us to maximize moving forward. Yeah, that's helpful. Um, I think I understand what you're talking about there. Um, Jennifer, uh, what are your thoughts on this topic around, again, unconscious bias and assumptions um, as an obstacle? Well, what Antoine was saying, um, I know he tapped in like neighborhoods. So as architects, we work in uh, various types of neighborhood neighborhoods. And m me, myself, like I am from <laughs> the south side of Chicago. Um, mm -hmm. not really like the best, um, the, you know, neighborhood to put in the best light in Chicago overall. But when we do projects in these neighborhoods, like, um, you know, at work, we'll, I, I might hear a comment about, hey, that neighborhood is really bad. Like, you know, things like that, or just even, you know, more negative comments. And my, my thing is like just working day to day with these people who think that way about your neighborhood. I think it's a, I think you have to find ways to, you know, professionally, um, um, I guess, educate them, right? Um, so you have to just see why they think that way and then at the same time, um, you know, educate them as in, like the good things about the neighborhood and, you know, don't, don't be mad. You know, we can still work together once I <laughs> explain this to you. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just an educational moment um, in most cases, and that's, that's kind of how we have to look at it, um, being from different backgrounds and different cultures. Um, but, yeah, it's definitely a, a thing, um, and, and it bothers uh, people who come from those types of neighborhoods when you say negative things like that, and people really don't realize that that affects us. Hmm. And is this some, so this is something that you're experiencing in your career um, in, in that, oh, your firm is in this particular neighborhood and, and sort of the negative con connotations around that. Am I understanding that right, Jennifer? Right. And, the, you know, not necessarily like the firm that you, mm -hmm. you know, you work at. It can be, you know, contractors. It can be your colleagues. Like, you know, it can be, you know, different, different, um, you know, avenues that you can hear this type of thing from. So, yeah. Got it. Okay. Uh, well, thank you all for your thoughts on the on, uh, on unconscious bias and sort of assumptions and how that impacts um, uh, your experience. Uh, Antoine, um, the next topic here as an obstacle is sort of low exposure and awareness of diversity in the profession. Uh, how have you observed this as an obstacle in your career or in, in your peers? Well, I think part of it is the fact that most uh, African-American architecture students, uh, as well as most architect, architects themselves, did not know one or had not met one or had not seen one uh, when they were growing up, right? And so mm -hmm. one of the things that we as an organization, National Organization of Minority Architects, are very, very intentional in trying to be visible. That's this year's theme by our president, Kim Dowdell, is mm -hmm. to be visible. Right to try to ensure that not only are we visible in the profession, but also in our communities, also in our schools. Uh, we have a national initiative that we've done for several years now called Project Pipeline uh, that has launched through many of our chapters. Actually, our Chicago chapter is arguably one of our best in mm -hmm. positing that, where we host uh, middle school children uh, in a summer camp. And so oftentimes it's over during the school year, sometimes summer camp, so that they're exposed to that, so that they're able to see what architecture is, and uh, basically give them the opportunity that most of us do not have. And I think if you expose young people to the discipline, then they're much more interested and also would know what it takes uh, to be involved in that. And that's something I think is gonna be critical to uh, increasing the number of women and people of color in the discipline. Uh, Antoine, you call, it's, it's Project Pipeline, isn't that right? Project Pipeline, yes. All right, cool. Folks can uh, Google that uh, to learn a little bit more about that, I bet. Um, April, um, talk a little bit about your experience with uh, with this uh, around exposure and awareness. Sure. So 
going through the profession, um, you know, sort of looking back and in preparation for this discussion, I was really thinking through like how many female mentors did I have? And I, I really didn't have any. I, I had some great male mentors. Um, and here I am now sitting in executive leadership and I still don't, I, I didn't have any of that ahead of me. I could, if I didn't see it, for some of us, some of us feel like we can't be it. So the fact that women weren't above me in executive leaderships, I can see why that would feed the unconscious bias. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in order to change that, you have to be the woman where there isn't one sometimes and continue to sit on boards, be in the fields, be at that meeting and represent um, women. And, you know, me personally, um, the way I've sort of taken this and executed it is I you know, could have joined Chicago Women in Architecture, which I am a member, but I made it a point to be part of an organization that didn't have a lot of women on its board mm -hmm. and am helping to work change um, the equity and diversity situation within um, you know, my organization. So that's that's sort of what I can contribute to this conversation. Yeah. yeah. So it's similarly, you know, uh, no mentors like me um, and you're already getting into the solution. So your solution to that is, well, I'm going to I'm going to become the, the mentor for the mm -hmm. next generation and and, uh, and and be the essentially be the change that you be the mentor that you wish you had yeah. in a way. Uh, Jennifer, um, what is your observation here? Um, I, I agree with Rachel, um, with finding mentors, um, you know, and sponsorship is a, is a for sure struggle. Um, in high school, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't even know black architects existed, <laughs> um, until, um, I got exposure, uh, from the Chicago Architecture Center Foundation at the time. Um, mm -hmm. and then I was, um, in the new house architecture competition. <laughs> And I realized that I had had a talent, but at the same time, I still didn't see um, myself um, out there in the field, not until I got introduced to NOMA. Um, and right now, we have about 477 black female architects, <laughs> um, which is a very low number. But I think our mission now is to just get to 500. And I know Tierra Hughes, um, she's a NOMA member as well. Um, she has the first 500. Um, program and she's putting it out there that um, you know we as uh, black women architects need to be um, you know on the scene and just be in the forefront and so that like these young women can look at us and hey it's it's not an you know it's it's a no brainer like you know there's no hesitation to become an architect or anything so we need to get ourselves out there and more exposed um, so these children and these young women can see us. Mm -hmm. so, that's really uh, interesting to hear. And again, I think it was starting to become clear just in the first few minutes of this is a potential, uh, you know, a, a really wonderful opportunity there for how you could potentially solve something like that. Let's move on to the next slide here, which is our third of three uh, obstacles we wanted to talk about. Um, this third one here is about limited support on the path to licensure and career growth. Uh, first, uh, Antoine, um, can you talk a little bit about your experience and what you've observed here? Well, absolutely. I think one of the things that I've observed and I've also heard uh, anecdotally is um, we need to have an opportunity uh, for growth or uh, leadership opportunities, right? I, I know way too many, quite frankly, uh, African-American project managers that have been in a firm that have 20 years of experience and haven't been able to be exposed to any sort of leadership capacity, right? How do you get that? And they've got people that are younger than them, have less experience, but that are being promoted either over them or faster than them. And I think that is something that we have to uh, really make a real uh, the conversation and uh, to move forward. Some of the challenges uh, that we have with, with licensure is that I, I know many colleagues that uh, you know graduated with a degree, could not get a job in architecture, took a job somewhere else, and then when they finally, you know, circled back to architecture, still are now trying to accrue the, the hours to even be able to sit. And then now you're trying to study for an exam when you have a family, you have kids, you know, you're, you're in your late 30s now. I mean, I've, I've, I know this personally from many people. And so mm -hmm. that is something that is, is a real challenge. 
Uh, I, I know we've made this conversation with NCAR recently, and, and I know that there are some other things in place to try to address that. But that is a real issue of late entrance into the discipline, as well as people that are in a discipline but not getting opportunities for leadership moving forward. Yeah. Jennifer, have you uh, observed this as well? Yes, um, for sure. Um, well, while in school, like I went to an HBCU, but while in school, like, I don't feel that like licensure was a, a true um, was the main goal. <laughs> the main goal was for us to just graduate, right? Mm -hmm. So when we got out of school, um, you know, then licensure kind of started becoming, you know, coming into the forefront, and you know that it was an important thing to have. But at the same time, it's like, where is the support? Um, you know, you guys weren't around Black Spectacles, <laughs> um, but you know. As, as I got older, I just started seeing that, hey, you know, maybe it's not, <laughs> maybe it's not for me to um, look for the support, maybe it's to be the support. Um, and we, you know, I've been taking exams for, I don't know, four years now. So I just try to make it a point where, um, where I, I create these programs um, for people, um, you know, our members in INOMA. Um, to to have a place where they can vent, we ha we started group meetings and and things like that. So <laughs> vent and also share successes, share um, you know failures and things like that, and just be a, a source of a resource for our members. So I think that um, once we start doing that more within these different organizations, um, you know you'll see more of us licensed. Mm -hmm. So yeah. And Mark, let's, yeah, before ahead. we jump off, just before we jump off this, one quick thing I I, I don't want us to forget is that yeah. licensure costs, right? <laughs> like it, it's not yeah, it's not, right. not cheap, right? And I can speak uh, I can speak definitely emphatically that we had some numbers somewhere between forty to fifty percent of African American architects work at a small firm or sole proprietorship uh, capacity. So you know their firm is probably not going to pay for their exams. Right. And, you know, so you know, they've, they've got to figure out how to do so. Um, myself and Jennifer work for Moody Nolan. It's, it's a great firm and they actually will, you know, reimburse and compensate uh, for exams. But that's not everybody's experience. Right. And so now you're trying to take a very expensive process and you may be working at a firm that's probably hazing you. Let's be honest about it. So you're working 60 hours a week and trying to find time to also study and God forbid, talk to your family if you have one. And so, you know, a lot of that does become uh, very prohibitive to trying to get your license in a timely fashion. Yeah, I think that's yeah. a great point. Yeah. Um, but yeah, what do you do when you don't have the support from your firm, you mm -hmm. know, um, in, in, in terms of licensure? Uh, I think we have to start thinking about that too. Yeah, I think that's a great observation. April, what have you uh, observed around limited support? Uh, on the path of licensure in your career? Um, all I really have is my own story, even though I know it may be a lot of women's stories, um, but a lot of us try to balance out, okay, how am I gonna get registered? How am I gonna move up far enough so that I will theoretically have the flexibility to have a family um, and be able to have this career and a family at the same time? Um, for me, um, I got registered before I got pregnant. Um, but I had my first child when I took over the company at seven months pregnant. Um, so it was not an ideal time to be taking over a company. Um, I now have a four-year-old and I have a nine-month-old um, and, and I'm running a board that represents 4,000 architects in Chicago. So none of this is ideal. Um, and again, I also own my own company, so I can, get, I can flexibly use my time um, and that's not uh, that's not a standard in this industry. So um, what I'm trying to do, and I know this is jumping a little into the solutions part, is to make sure that um, that is different for the people that come after me. So I do pay for exams in my office. I do pay for time to be out of the office and study. I have a maternity paternity paid leave um, program, and we're only six people, but you have to like. You were sort of saying before, Mark, you have to be the change you want to see. So mm -hmm. I'm in a position to do that. And that's why we need more um, diversity in this profession. So as we rise through the ranks, women and minorities, we can be that change that we want to see and make it easier for the people that come behind us. 
Uh, thank you. I'm actually taking notes here as I'm going along. Um, that's helpful, uh, I think. Um, so I wrote, trying to balance your career aspirations and also the timing of those sort of, um, yeah, the timing of those, of the stages, I guess, of your career with your interests in, uh, in having a family. And I, and think, I, I will say, I hope I'm not, I hope I'm not coming across saying I had to wait to get pregnant, but that is definitely how I felt. Sure. Um, now that I have done that and looking back over my career, uh -huh. I, I try to tell other women in my position that life is never going to be perfect and you can't wait for it all to align. So you need to do what works for you and you need to make sure that you have a strong community around you. Um, uh, around the topic of limited support here, Alexandra, I know we didn't have you queued up to talk on this particular point, but I have to imagine though that um, with English as a second language, can you talk about like, is there, are there obstacles around, uh, you know, on the path to licensure for folks uh, for whom English is a second language? Is that a, a legitimate obstacle that you've encountered or observed others encounter? I am currently encountering it. So it is, it is extremely legitimate reason. Um, mm -hmm. And the same way that it's affecting your, your day in and day out, this whole this whole point of you know there's no perfect time to start testing there's no perfect start uh, time to start uh, family um, I fully agree with it I'm kind of in that moment currently as well mm -hmm. but you know and with licensure and just taking on the healthcare division imagine trying me trying to say the fancy words that come along with that because um, <laughs> I've decided to make life more complicated for myself but. I would say, and because I have joined um, your study groups, I have also noticed that it's not necessarily even just for for a second language or a third language speaking people. It's also for Americans. You, there's some serious issues with um, with words that are mm -hmm. trip words in the test. That tests are twisting the the hmm. words on it or the meanings on it. And let alone if that's already struggling enough for first language Americans. You can only imagine how much worse it is for somebody that's second guessing themselves, then twists it, and then you're also under a time limit. So <laughs> one one or two of those words have twisted me in the past before, and I'm not ashamed to say I've failed tests because of it. Because looking back with this with the anxiety that you have sitting under these three hours and not understanding a word or two that just gets thrown at you is almost crippling. Um, so the the way that I've found a way to, for the solution is you have to you have to make it your second nature. You have to yes, it will take longer. It took me twice as long to study for them. It took me twice as long to take them, and there's no shame in it. Also, life got in the way. As long as you motivate yourself and you get through it, that's what matters. You you have nothing to prove to anybody but yourself, essentially. Mm -hmm. Correct. So. Most of most of the words I've had to get tutoring on, which mm -hmm. was extremely helpful, and I'm definitely okay with. A lot of people have a stigma about admitting that. I don't really understand why. Um, I think that's another topic. But mm -hmm. within the tests themselves, they're only getting harder, and they're not as much like Antoine was mentioning. They're not as much about real life at some point. It's it's a knowledge base. It's almost and now they've removed it from the um, the memorization portion of it, which probably mm -hmm. made it easier. Now the thinking portion of it is completely different, especially culturally. Mm -hmm. So I've also seen people struggle with that uh, in some of the groups that I've joined. And mm -hmm. the supports that I've been in are group chats about supports of what do you think they meant here? I have mm -hmm. no idea. Um, so mm -hmm. language-wise, those were... And culturally, those are some of the the worst parts of it. Yeah. But but I, I think there is a light at the end of the tunnel. I think once you get one or two tests out of the way and you start to realize what the testing method is, and I mm -hmm. think I, I I'm making that a point because don't overthink it. Just do what the test tells you, <laughs> mm -hmm. and you might have a chance because otherwise you're fighting a battle you're not going to be able to fight and or that you don't understand because these words are some of them are extreme 
Yeah, that's helpful. In fact, it's interesting. I, um, I thought about it only as the, the actual words themselves, but it's interesting to hear you talk about just even the scenarios or thinking through the solution, um, how there are sort of cultural implications that might be, um, uh, let's say, just sort of implied that, uh, mm -hmm. that uh, what might make it uh, more challenging. Um, so thank you for that. I'm going to stay with you here, uh, Alexandra, as we begin to look at you know some potential ways to overcome some of these obstacles. So on this on this topic we started with around challenging um, the bias. Um, what are some potential ways you think that we can overcome this? I don't have the solution for everybody. Um, I know what has worked for me, uh -huh. and I might be in denial about it, but it's fine so far. <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I don't really have the quantification behind it or you know, the testing. But what I've started doing, and also because I'm because I'm also a female, it started I started noticing uh, transitional issues or challenges once I've, once I've gotten into management, and that's because I started making more face to meetings and directly contacting the client and the GC and showing up to these meetings by myself. And I will tell you, some companies did not support me on that, especially mm -hmm. also on testing for the ARIES, which is why I, we mentioned earlier, what do you do? What I did is I took my life into my own hands and I decided to switch jobs. Mm -hmm. I made it a point when I start a new job, I need half Fridays every other week or whatever it would be to, to test for these for the test. Mm -hmm. And the new company has worked with me on mm -hmm. that so far. Um, I would also say that the if you can't find it or you don't have the support at your current company to do that, or even in field for you to even grow as an architect, I would say find the find the right balance. I've noticed in smaller companies there's more support because they care more about your invest you as an investment. So they will handhold you less. You'll be wearing more hats, which helps. Um, for instance, uh, I brought up before a scenario in which I've walked onto the site with my with my with the principal right next to me, and everybody addressed him even though I was the uh, main point of contact. And this wasn't the first time that we've interacted. And mm -hmm. the best support I've ever gotten is from him looking at everybody and saying, why are you asking me? Talk to her. And mm -hmm. since that moment, nobody's, nobody sees him to things. It's, I'm kind of the main point, but it's sad that there needed to be that additional reassurance there. Mm -hmm. um, but a way to do that is now with all the clients since I've been working at this firm, there hasn't been an issue ever since. So the way we're talking about how do you grow past it, how do you promote these things is my way is just pre pretending and acting like it's supposed to be. So act the way you want to be treated, the same way as, you know, dress for the job that you want, act the way you want, and it seems so far that it hasn't been questioned. It's almost like a confidence boost as well when you walk onto the site and, you know, you get addressed or you address the meeting or you actually take on the meeting. And this has actually helped with my testing as well. Really? It's, yes. It's given me a little bit of a boost of, you know what? Yeah. The amount of information we have to study for and the amount of books and all these things online are, you can jump into a rabbit hole and never come back out and it's extremely intimidating. So it does also ruin your self-esteem. <laughs> I'll admit that part too. It's, sure. Especially when you fail one and you just what? I study yeah. more than forty hours. What's what happened? Yeah. Um, but I think overall, just studying for the ARES and everything helps helps you become a better, more confident architect. And mm -hmm. I know that's kind of the point. Um, I just think obstacle-wise, take it one day at a time. You're not here to, unless you are, to conquer the world. Go for it. Um, <laughs> But I would take one challenge at a time. Whether it's an English barrier, which there, what I've done is I've pre-prepared myself to meetings. I have pre-wrote down answers to certain parts that I knew might have come up or I knew the client wanted to discuss. So, for instance, there's technical words that I still don't understand 
that's just mumbo jumbo to me. But if you put them in the right order, it mm-hmm. seems that everybody else understands. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't have the engineering experience to know that. So it helps to prepare. Mm-hmm. In in my situation, when I am over, when I am translating still, so, um, and it's also, I think that that's kind of where I want to end with it because there's a balance between that and just every, like you know, everybody reacts to the confidence that you portray, and mm-hmm. as a as a younger woman walking onto the job site, it's intimidating, but just stand your ground. You know your shit. You should be mm-hmm. okay. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. Um, April, uh, so thank you for that, Alexandra. Uh, there's a lot of really good stuff there. Uh, April, um, what are some thoughts you have around overcoming uh, uh, biases and so forth? Sure. So I'm probably just going to dogpile on what Alexandra said there. Um, there's an unfortunate mix of two things in this industry, and it's being young and it's being a woman, mm-hmm. because then there's this assumption of less authority, less knowledge, and more administration. So my solution for challenging this is to make sure that you get out in front of this. I've seen this in myself. I still fight it today. And I've seen it in women in small companies, large companies. They volunteer to be the party planner, the meeting mate, meeting agenda, note taker. So don't do that. Be the delegator. Run the meeting. Volunteer to lead. Volunteer to take on the technical task. Um, and I, I feel like that's the way that um, you're going to start to break out of some of this almost like predetermined cultural expectations of women in the workplace. Mic drop. That's a good one, yeah. Um, <laughs> I like that dog pile on it. Um, uh, Jennifer, what uh, what are your comments on this? What are your thoughts and observations here? Um, well, yeah, I, I definitely agree with April and Alexandria. Um, <laughs> I agree. Like I was so nervous um, at times when, I don't know, my boss was just like, my manager was like, Oh, um, I'm not going to be in today. Can you, (laughs) can you run this meeting? Um, But, but for, for someone to just throw that on you, honestly, you have to think about it. Like they actually believe in me. They believe that I can, I can do this. Um, So you, you know, instead of being nervous, you know, just try to have more confidence about um, taking on tasks like that. Uh, and, and, you know, no matter who you are, woman, male, whatever um, cultural differences you all have with the owner or contractor, like put all that aside and just know that you know what you're doing <laughs> or the work that you're doing. You've worked on these drawings for, I don't know, weeks, you know, mm-hmm. so you should honestly know um, what you're going to be talking about. <laughs> Um, and to come back with, you know, coordinating things with engineers and, you know, things like that. Like all of that is like really true, like the true grit of the, of experiences of of what we do as architects. So, um, to get thrown into it, I definitely would encourage, um, you know, everyone to take, uh, to take that on, you know, so. Thank you for that. Can I add to that just one thing? I, I started realizing that. I essentially got thrown into management position and I didn't know what was what was happening at the time until one of my friends told me that I was experiencing the imposter syndrome. And I'm pretty sure everybody's heard of it. And to be honest, as soon as I realized that I was doing it, I snapped out of it. Um, it, it happened, especially to, I feel more to women. Uh, it's essentially the idea that you don't, feel like you belong at the party, like you're, yeah. you shouldn't be there. Yeah. It, it is, it's intimidating. It's uh, definitely emotional. And I, I don't know what it's brought up on or by, but it does exist. If you're more aware of it, the more you can say, you know what, I'll take it slow. Nobody's pushing you. Um, I, the same as with tests. I'll take it one day at a time. It's going to be okay. Yeah, really good stuff here. I, I feel like this, this in a way, like a lot of what you guys are saying is something about like anticipating the bias that you might encounter and then mm-hmm. essentially preparing yourself to like go to battle with that bias in advance. So whether that's whatever it is, whatever the bias is, you don't want to um, be subjected to. And perhaps it's different for different people. Um, 
but sort of choosing, all right, listen, this keeps getting dumped on me. This this preconceived idea keeps getting dumped on me, and I don't like that one. So then, like, sort of being intentional and, and actually preparing to thwart it. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you guys for sharing uh, sharing there. Um, the next, uh, the second, um, you know, potential uh, way to overcome the obstacles here, uh, we're talking about promoting accomplishments and the pr presence of people like you um, in this profession. April, um, what are your thoughts and experiences around ways you might be able to um, sort of uh, achieve this? Um, I, I just think one of the best things that you can do um, like on the ground day to day is make sure that you have allies in your career. Mm -hmm. And specifically what I mean by that is in the instance where I know that it's highly likely I'm gonna be with my male colleague and he will likely be addressed instead of me, that he makes sure to turn it over to me immediately. Um, and, and that is an ally right there in the meeting. Um, the second thing is you know, maybe you have to be a little bit more intentional about mentorship. And I think a lot of people think that mentorship is something that happens to them. And it's really something you need to seek out. And so for me, um, I sort of, before I owned a business, but I knew I wanted to, um, assembled uh, my own sort of like Avengers t team <laughs> of super mentors, people who had started their own businesses, not necessarily in architecture, but mostly women, um, and talked me through like, what the difference was between jumping off the cliff or being pushed. And it was really empowering for me to see other women um, talk about executive leadership and pushing past uh, the biases and the, the, the obstacles in order to get where they were. So th those are two things I think that everyone can do. Um, and that you also have to strip the fear away as well and, and just say, hey, you know what? I know this is sort of uncomfortable, but like approach someone that, and say, I think your career is amazing and I would love to just take you out for a cup of coffee and just pick your brain about how I can do something even remotely as cool as you or whatever. Yeah, yeah. so um, so that's awesome. Um, and just even thinking about myself, like that's something I would be terrified to do. Can you, can you t share a story of someone who you did that to and how that went? I feel like hearing those stories is, is often helpful for, for folks yeah. who are like, I would never do so that. So I worked at a firm where we hired a PR company, mm -hmm. local here in Chicago, and the woman owned her own PR company. <clears throat> and I was working with her, and we kind of established like a really good relationship. And so I just emailed her one day and said, hey, and I was still working at this job. Mm -hmm. um, I hope that are those people listening? I have no idea. Uh, and I just kicked them all off. Yeah. And I said, hey, you know what? Can I just take you out for a cup of coffee to just talk about like, career stuff and she was like absolutely and we went out and I just kind of gave her the straight dope and I said hey I'm I want to do this how did you do it you know can you just tell me your story mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it started with that and it's continued now for like the past 10 years I can still reach out to her call her meet her say I'm dealing with this challenging situation you know can you help me but had I thought, 10 years ago thought that like that was something that I could have, yeah. like it wasn't going to happen to me. I had yeah. to make it happen. Did you um, in those conversations, did you, did you say like, I want you like, did you bring any formality to it? In other words, did you no, say, I didn't I really want say you to like, you are going to be Black Widow in the Avengers. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. I, I, I just established a relationship yeah. and said, hey. And what's really funny is now mm -hmm. I. I'm doing this for other women, and a few of them have said to me, you're my mentor, and I'm like, no, I'm not old enough to be your mentor. What are you talking about? Um, but you, you don't have to formalize it. You just have yeah. to establish a relationship. Oh, that's helpful. That's really good. Um, is anyone else here, uh, ha have they experienced something like that where they've tried to create some mentors uh, in their life and their career? I can tell you, I'll jump in. I apologize. I just, you know, I think one of the reasons why uh, I have such a long relationship with Noma is because mm -hmm. I was able to find, seek out, and receive mentors through the organization. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that I agree with everyone on the call about is that it's important for the growth of us, each of us professionally, to have mentors. But when I went to uh, my institution, I went to uh, both my schools 
were uh, PWI, right? So there was very small African-American population in the School of Architecture, both at, uh, at Cornell and the University of Texas. And I remember distinctly uh, going to a couple professors for mentorship and being rebuffed uh, pretty strongly, actually. Really? Uh, oh, absolutely. And, uh, and I remember the very first time I went to an AIA meeting in New York City as a 19-year-old. And uh, if any of you have been to the AIA conference, right, it's, it's pretty uh, formidable if you're an underclassman and, and it's, you know, 15,000 people and there really aren't that many that look like you there. Uh, it can be pretty, uh, it's pretty tough. And I could not find a quote unquote mentor in that capacity. But when I went to my very first NOMA conference as a college sophomore and being able to literally break bread with uh, men and women who were not only uh, architects, but who were fellows or who were firm owners or who had been in the discipline for 20, 30 years, and they would talk to you just like they'd met you, you know, yesterday and, and have a real conversation, uh, that's when you're able to, to really begin to form your academic and your professional uh, career because you're able to establish a relationship with someone that understands and appreciates your process. And so that's one of the primary reasons why I not only got involved but had stayed involved in NOMA for the better part of the last 25 years now. Hmm. That's awesome. Um, and I, I think the, there's a common thread here, right, which is uh, you didn't sit around and wait for mentors to show up. You you took some action. Um, and maybe in April's story, she, you know, you found uh, you, you found someone you, you looked up to and you just straight up asked her for lunch. Whereas uh, um, Antoine, in your story, you're like, well, I cannot, I'm not getting where I want to get with this mentoring thing. So I'm, maybe I'll join this group. And uh, maybe you can find it there. So that's really cool uh, to hear. Um, does anyone else have any similar stories? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I have a cautionary tale about that. Um, hmm. Not all mentors are just just be careful with whom you ask and what you ask. <laughs> it's not mm -hmm. always um, in your best interest, or more mm -hmm. more to say, you don't know what your interest needs to be, which is why you're asking for advice. So I. I've done the mistake of not researching sufficiently or not knowing, um, just jumping jumping the gun and asking one or two people and taking their advice to heart, mm -hmm. which sidetracked my career for a little bit, but it, you know, it was a good learning experience now that I've already done it. Um, I would just say do your research. And make sure that whom you're asking, you know this you know this the statement never you should never meet your heroes. <laughs> There's there's something to that as well, um, but any advice is good advice because the best that I've ever gotten is what not to do. Mm. The things that you should not be doing is so much more valuable than the things that you should be doing. Um, it helps you kind of stray away from the major chaoses that the career could bring you and even to the path of licensure. There's a lot of people that, have, um, that aren't unable to get the tip of the test due to go into the wrong schools or the accreditations and there's there's so much minutia in it that I think you just need to be careful whom you attach yourself to. Yeah that's an interesting point and in one in my own experience in, in, in finding mentors as I run this business um, and advisors what's interesting is also to there was a moment where I had one mentor and then, um, and now I've added a couple more. And so what's really interesting is having multiple mentors and what they do is they help you triangulate. You know, one person will tell you, well, you should go left. The other person says you should go right. And the other person is like, well, I've had a lot more experience with left. And, you, and, and you hear their experiences um, and you can kind of make your own decision about what the what yeah. what you want to do, which is kind of interesting. And in fact, which is contrary to what some folks have advised me in the past, is like, oh yeah, you, you shouldn't have too many advisors. But I've actually found it to be really powerful because it helps you, like to your point, Alexandra, it helps you clarify what you want to do um, by hearing a, a couple of the different variations. I think so too. I'm just going to jump in here too, um, and and just say that I totally agree with that. And and I just wanted to note that the super group of uh, mentors that I put together, um, ironically, did not have an architect in it. I was more focused on entrepreneurship. And looking back, um, I realized that when I was approaching people that I thought could help me in architecture, one of their first 
um, comments back to me is why would you want to have an architecture firm? It's so hard. Um, and you don't get to focus on the fun design stuff. You're too busy running a spreadsheet. And that wasn't really the, um, that wasn't the pumping up that I needed. So I would just say that, you know, don't be so hamstrung by just looking around in this industry. It is really important, but That's I think when you can talk to other people outside of architecture, sometimes it strips away the BS that all of us fill our heads with as architects. And there is a whole other world out there. So it's just, um, it's an option. Uh, very good. So thank you for that, uh, everyone. Let's move on to the last uh, last topic here, the last uh, uh, idea, last group of ideas around overcoming obstacles around seeking mentorship, creating support, getting involved. Um, Antoine, do you want to talk a little bit about, you know, uh, what you think can be a, a good way to overcome this particular obstacle? Uh, sure. As far as uh, mentorship and, and, and moving forward and, and also exposure, uh, I think a lot of it is encapsulated in what we discussed already. Um, I've mm -hmm. spoken extensively about NOMA. I agree with April's point about finding uh, mentors outside of the discipline. Uh, quite frankly, most of my mentors are outside of architects because, you know, a lot of architects are socially awkward anyway. So <laughs> that's a whole different discussion. But, uh, you know, I've, I've got mentors in city government, I've got mentors in politics uh, and mentors in business. And I think it's important that if we really want to be effective, that we have those. Um, I think it's important that we continue to expose uh, the discipline to uh, our younger professionals and our students. Um, Jennifer talked about um, the first 500 initiative by uh, Tierra Hughes in Chicago, which is it's a great opportunity to, to showcase, uh, you know, the licensed black women architects in this country, which are incredibly small. And so, you know, that's something that I think is a great effort. Uh, another friend of ours, um, Tiffany Brown, she has something called 400 Forward, which is actually looking uh, exactly that. She is actively trying to uh, expose and mentor uh, black girls. And, and is uh, focusing on uh, Detroit and the greater uh, Michigan area uh, and also going national with that initiative, right? So she wants to, you know, formulate the next 400 licensed black women through focusing on young women and, 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 tr and girls. And so we have to continue to be visible. We have to continue to seek mentors, but also we have to use medium like this to uh, challenge the discipline and challenge uh, the entities that license all of us to be more inclusive and to ensure that we're not only at the table but actually have the opportunity to uh, create policy. Uh, you know, there's an, an oft-used quote that if you're not at, on the, at the table that you're on the menu. And uh, I'd rather not be on the menu right now. <laughs> That's good. Um, and looking at uh, and looking at some of the things that we had sort of pre-planned to talk about here, it looks like we've talked about a lot of these things. Um, Ken, I'm looking at our questions. We've had quite a few comments come through here. Um, and uh, I'm going to ask uh, Jennifer here. Maybe you can talk to this. Um, Willie asked a question uh, a little bit earlier and said, you know, what do you do when you're the only minority in your office and you're looking for a NOMA organization that does not exist in your city? Um, can you talk a little bit about, have you, are you familiar with what you do about that? Uh, a NOMA organization? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so what do you do um, if you don't have, it's a lot of small cities, small towns around, but um, typically um, if they're, isn't a NOMA uh, base in your state, you would um, kind of connect with a closer state or closer city. And honestly, um, if you have enough um, members, I think it's a 10 or something like that, um, yep. you know, they can reach out. Yeah, there's if you have 10 um, members or people who are willing to be members within your city, then you can try to establish your own NOMA chapter. Um, so there's and NOMAS as well. So you know if you're at a a college or university, um, you can do the same thing. So if you just reach out to NOMA Nationals, um, we can we can help you out with that. That's uh, that's good. Uh, so to say it back to you, uh, you know basically find a, a a NOMA chapter that's nearby, connect with them, and then or, yeah, uh, perhaps uh, maybe we could even connect. Uh, connect you to uh, connect someone uh, really maybe we could connect you to uh, to Antoine or Jennifer who might be able to help you with that yeah um, yeah 
let me look here through the questions that we have. Um, Chandler asked an interesting question um, when we were talking about uh, April. You were talking about you know the unconscious bias around you know oh well you should just handle the party planning and you should just do the uh, you should do the uh, yeah, the meeting minutes or something like that. Um, but Chandler says, what if being a party planner is actually a strength of yours? Um, do you kind of hide that in order to get ahead or do you remain authentic to that? Which I think is kind of an interesting question. That's a, that's a tough one um, because, but I'm, I live that because I'm, a, I'm an organizer, I'm a planner and parties fall under that. Um, I'm about to turn 40, I'm gonna, I'm trying to like make an amazing party. It's what I do. Um, but I, I realized that, um, that's not going to help. That didn't help me then. And it's not going to help me now to sort of always, even with AIA stuff. Um, I'll just give you this example. So we had a holiday party. It's our 150th anniversary and we set up a photo booth and we needed to make props for the photo booth and no one really volunteered. So I volunteered myself to be making photo booth props for our holiday party for 500 people. And I realized that I was party momming this thing and that that's not something I needed to be doing. So, you know, sometimes you're not helping yourself, um, even though maybe it is the authentic thing to do. Maybe authentically you think you're a great joke teller and you're very funny, but maybe sometimes that won't come off so well with everyone in the room. So sometimes you have to gauge what is authentically you versus what is professionally in your best interest. Yeah, it's interesting being selective about how you, uh, or being maybe intentional again about how you utilize your skills depending on what it is you're trying to achieve. Um, okay, uh, April, um, as you mentioned earlier, you're a member of Chicago Women in Architecture, which is um, a volunteer organization that helps uh, and provides a forum for women in architecture and related professions. Are there other um, similar types of organizations like in, uh, uh, in other cities or other states that are similar to that, that, that are even connected in some way? Or? Um, I don't want to speak on behalf of DWA, but I will say that I know that um, there are other AIA chapters that have had their own committees related to this. Ah. Um, I'm not honestly 100% sure that there are any like municipal separate yeah. architect organizations that are women focused um other than the cwa i'm not really sure okay but sure. i think minneapolis actually has a their aia chapter has a women's group thank you for that okay great well we're running up against the clock here so uh, uh i want to thank all of you um april antoine jennifer alexandra for uh, sharing your experiences and um, and sharing a variety of ideas for how we could potentially um, overcome some of these obstacles. Um, so thank you very much for, for participating. Thanks everyone for, for tuning in and listening. Um, at our next ARE Live podcast, we will um, kind of resume uh, our mock exam uh, kind of focus. Uh, we're going to review issues related to the construction and evaluation exam. Um, we're posting the uh, the link to register for that for the next one, um, or you can just go to blackspectacles.com slash podcast to register uh, for that. Um, if you want to learn more about our test prep curriculum here at Black Spectacles, you can go to our website uh, where you can learn more about that. Um, and interestingly, I guess, uh, talking about the firm supporting you, we do offer a firm license. Uh, and, uh, and as I mentioned as well, we're doing the Lunch and Learns in, um, in Los Angeles in a few uh, in a few months. So you can uh, fill out that form and, and, uh, and share your interest in that. And then finally, tomorrow, we're going to email everybody a follow-up about today's live broadcast. So let us know what you think. Uh, share any suggestions for any other topics you think we might uh, want to cover. Uh, we read every word that you guys write and use them to tune our next episodes. So thanks for tuning in. Mm -hmm.